platforms. Um, today, I'm talking about the Android HAL. And um, you know, this is, this is where I was about two years ago. I had just a, an off-the-shelf, uh, it was actually a Beagle board, not a Beagle bone, as pictured there, and a, a sensor board, and I want to put, them, put the two of them together. And, um, you know, it seems like that should be easy, right? All the source code's out there. All the drivers are there. Android's completely open source. But um, it was, uh, there was no documentation, right? And, and a common thread I keep hearing at this conference, it seems like we're all going and sort of you know, combing through the source code and reverse engineering you know, the big picture um, out of all these details. And so that's, that's what I want to share today. Uh, another reason you might want to do this um, is for off-the-shelf devices, right? On what I was showing before, traditionally, you know, you have um, sensors talking to the application processor over a chip-to-chip -chip interconnect, I squared C, SPI. And, uh, but what I think, there's some really interesting possibilities for connecting up, say, an off-the-shelf, you know, no-name Android TV to um, a Bluetooth temperature sensor. Um, or, you know, over there you say, well, that, that looks like another one of those boards. But what's interesting about that board from Freescale, um, and if you download these slides, you, you can click through these um, links to these to, to actually find them. That's a USB sensor hub. And so you can, you know, put it in your own little box, connect it up on USB, no soldering, um, no header pins required. All right. Or maybe you just want to get more functionality out of the phone you have. Because like so many things, the hardware provides a lot more functionality than um, the software makes available. Um, in particular, uh, on the Galaxy S3, the, um, it has a barometer. And the barometer needs a very good temperature sensor on there. And, uh, <clears throat> but the sensor HAL that ships with that device doesn't bring the temperature sensor out. Why not? It's uh, probably the best guess at ambient room temperature you have. So, um, you know, this is, I hope with what I'm talking about today, you could go grab your device and start poking around and, and see what you can see um, if you can unlock a little hidden functionality. All right, so yeah, you should be able to, to do this. Start, in, start experimenting, integrate some new sensors, and um, you know, get, a, get an idea of when things aren't working, where you, where you need to start debugging. All right, so here's the problem. It's actually better than it was a couple years ago. But if you go Google that, this is, this is the page that comes up, and it, it basically points you towards the header. It says, this is, this is the how. You should go implement it. And you go, you open up that header, and it's a whole bunch of, um, it's object-oriented style C with, with these uh, function pointers. And at first glance, you look at it, and you go, what the hell is this? How, how do I do that? Um, and like, like I said before, the source code's there, but not much of the big picture. All right, so here is the big picture. And if you went to the, the, um, the camera 2.0 talk yesterday, right, this is a, a similar kind of diagram because um, Android, they use the same HAL sort of mechanisms for sensors, GPS, camera. Right, they're, they're trying to insulate the Android internals from you know, device to device changes. And so every device that ships has its own you know, slightly different um, sensors.so or lib sensor it's sometimes called. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go back and forth using them, use them interchangeably along with HAL. Uh, but they're all the same thing. They're that, that blue box. And if you're making a device or you want to change how the sensors work, you want to put your code there. All right. <coughs> so let's walk through the data flow. Not such a different slide. So all the way at the top, we have applications. All the way at the bottom, we have silicon, you know, these, these great MEMS devices. And <clears throat> what's, what's great about doing this, if you replace the HAL, is all those apps you can download from um, 
the Google Play Store and elsewhere, they use the standard Android APIs, they can now talk to the sensors on your device. No changes, no effort on your part you know, to, to do apps. I think that's one of the great parts about Android. Um, so just walking through how this goes, let's say you, you fire up an application that requests the accelerometer. That comes down here to the, uh, the sensor manager, you know, inside Android. And the sensor manager is what takes care of if you have three applications and they're all asking for the, the accelerometer data. It, does, it keeps track of who's listening and at what rates and who wants the data. <coughs> that comes down here as a request to the sensor HAL. If, if the accelerometer isn't turned on, the sensor manager knows that and tells the HAL, hey, go enable the accelerometer. And once you enable it, please set it at this rate. And you, you notice, the, if you're familiar with the um, Android Sensor Manager APIs, where you request you know, uh, the fastest rate or the slower rate, that translates pretty directly into the sensor HAL call. Then this is, this is where it starts to get different on each device, is the, um, depending on the sensors that you have connected and, how, and what drivers they have, that HAL is, is going to have some intimate knowledge that, OK, for the accelerometer, I need to use SysFS to enable it. And there's a SysFS entry for, for that device. That goes through that Linux infrastructure, standard drivers, all the way down to the silicon. Uh, likewise, you'll, um, so that's the enable. And then what happens is the sensor manager keeps the timer and starts asking the HAL, hey, do you have any data? Do you have any data? At whether it's 5 hertz or 200 hertz or uh, whatever the system can do. All right. So, <coughs> kind of talking a little bit more at the top of the stack here. <coughs> this is, I'm going to have a little um, map to keep that bigger picture in mind. This is one of my favorite um, sensor apps. It's nothing fancy, but it's fancier than anything I would have built myself which is usually just text streaming on a console. And it, uh, it tells you all the, all the sensors that the HAL um, says are there. Right? So you can actually have more sensors on the device, but if the HAL doesn't bring them up, Android Sensor Manager isn't going to know about it, and neither will any of the apps. Um, at the, the keynote yesterday, the guy from NASA was talking about the, the Cellbots data logger. It's another great sensor application. And I think this is, uh, this is part of the joy of Android. You don't have to write those. All right, so kind of jumping around a little bit. I'm not going to talk um, about sensor drivers. This is actually a real key <laughs> sticking point um, when you're trying to uh, hack on devices is are the drivers doing, you know, are they available for your sensors? Do they have any... Um, uh, incompatibilities with what you want to do. And I, I talked for a long time about this, and actually a little uh, shameless plug. At, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk at Design West um, about reusing sensor drivers that are already out there and porting them to different systems. All right, so I won't talk about sensor drivers today. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit about the Linux infrastructure that, that the HAL really relies on, or you're going to rely on if you're, if you're building the HAL. And you think about those drivers as having kind of a bottom API that they use to access SPI or I2C or you know, USB. But at the top level is really where the, the how gets involved is what's the top level interface that those drivers prevent, uh, excuse me, present. And <coughs> most, you know, two years ago, a year ago maybe even, most drivers had um, input event interfaces. And I'll go into detail. I'm going to talk about input event today. Sensor manufacturers are moving away from this and doing um, uh, IIO drivers and, and some different, different methodologies. But what's great about input event drivers is they're, they're easy to write. Um, and they're also very easy to work with the command line, which is why I'm going to talk about them today. But I think that the big key with the Linux infrastructure is there's so many tools out there. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Use something that's there. Okay. 
input event framework hails from uh, the days of you know, way back when. It, it's really rooted in mice, keyboard, and joysticks. Um, and I, I think a lot of people kind of look sideways at it when they first see it, but it, it really is handy to work with. All right, so here's, here's the demo part. And, and the thing I want you to remember out of this demo is that the input event framework it presents the sensors um, as a name that you can understand, like MPU 6050 accelerometer, um, and a whole stream of events. All right. So usually the first thing you want to do, um, kind of backing up here, is the, what I want to show here is it's hard to write the HAL if you don't know how to read the data. So that's why in this demo I'll walk through you know, finding out what sensors are there and reading the data. And then the HAL is going to have to do that same, the same thing we're going to do with the command line. But, all right, so here we go. Uh, let's see. Oh. OK, so we start up ADB shell. And if you just go and, uh, you know, drivers prevent, you know, they, they look like files, you should be able to to cap them, right? You should be able to, you can go in LS, you know, they, all the input event drivers show up in dev input. But it's, you know, which of those 14 devices is the one we're interested in? So to do that, um, you just have to remember this magic, you know, incantation here. In the proc file system, there's a place where you can find out all the names and gory details about each of the devices. So on here, you can see that there's a, um, there's a the light sensor. Um, you know, we've got some, some other jack. You know, a lot of buttons and uh, different other peripherals show up as input event devices. The ones we care about um, for the sensor HAL, obviously, are the sensors here. And what you want to look for is this line that says handlers. And that tells you the, um, the device file that you can read. And so the accelerometer that I want to look at is on event six. So let's go cat event six. And uh, this is kind of a setup here because catting this is a bad idea. It's not going to hurt anything. And there's all that garbage. And so why is all that garbage coming out? Well, because it's not. Uh, that's a binary file. It's a, a whole series of these input event structs, which have a timestamp, you know, code. They've, they've got some other stuff I'll talk about. But at the command line, it's great. There's something built in. It's in an, every Android um, distribution, you know, on, or uh, every Android device I've tried has get event. And you can use get event. I'll use the dash T to get a timestamp, because that's a very key property of input devices. There it goes. All that data comes out. And if you look here, so we've got um, the, the format is timestamp, event type, event code, and then data. So event type is telling you if it's a zero, it's, uh, sorry, this is um, <clears throat> this, whether it's a sync or relative absolute. You don't have to pay too much attention other to know that this is real data, and this is saying, hey, these three records go together. That's a sync. Then the code, 0, 1, 2, that's x, y, z. And if you look at the values, that, that actually makes sense for an accelerometer, because what do accelerometers do mostly? They measure gravity coming down. And, um, and you can know that it's sitting flat on a table. And so, right, we do our the conversion. This is actually a negative number really close to 0. That's really you know, x, y. Those are both pretty close to 0. And this right here, 2,000 hex, just you know, because I've spent too much time doing that, I know that's, um, that's what gravity shows up on this sensor as. Now, that doesn't look like. You know, an Andro sensor, it was saying 9.8 meters per second squared is what gravity is coming down as. And that's a big job of lib sensor is to convert those driver values into floating point, you know, real engineering units. 
And what can, can mess you up is if the driver is, say, in a, uh, right now it's in a 4G mode, but that accelerometer supports like an 8G and a 2G. And if somebody's changed the mode on you, or you've changed the mode and forgot about it, that conversion factor changes. And so it's something that the HAL has to keep track of if you're going to switch ranges or you're new to anything strange. Um, all right. So yeah, use get event. It's very handy. Um, and in fact, you know, I've taken qualified to see if this, how well the sensors are working on a platform just by piping this into a file, pulling it out, you know, uh, parsing it up. There, there's a whole lot you can do with this before the rest of the Android system is, is built if you're building your own board. And you just want to know, hey, how, how good are the sensors working? Um, right. So input events are a data pipe. If you look in the header, there is technically a back channel for force feedback joysticks um, that I've been tempted to piggyback on. Um, but really, it's the common way to do it is to use um, make sysfs entries for control. And here you'll see this little demo will um, start up. It's going to go read a bunch of data, I think. Oh, first I'm going to turn it off. There we go. Uh, here. So this is our, our good friend Echo. And this, you know, how do you find this path? Where does that magic come from? That's, you've got to go read um, the driver uh, and see where it's, where it's putting it. This particular driver, sometimes some people put them in um, sys class sensors. They put the enables. If you dig around in sys class sensors, you might even be able to find ways to you know, uh, read the raw data or read calibration values. The Samsung devices tend to put them here, or the drivers on Samsung devices, I should say. OK. So oh, yeah, got to redirect in the file. So now I try and get event again. And no luck, right? It, it's trying to, nothing, nothing happening there, as we expect. I'm going to go back, enable the sensor, and events show up. Right, and so the, the, those actions right there are most of what your HAL needs to do. I mean, there, there's other details. Um, but that's the key thing, is how the HAL needs to operate the sensor drivers to, to enable them and get the data out of them. All right. So here is um, this header. Go, go open it up, take a look at it. And here's the important bits. Input event devices make input event structs. And it's the same thing we were uh, printing out with get event. Timestamp, um, a type code value. And you know, the difference between, you know, you could, you'll see over there some of the types of key. This shows the keyboard legacy of this. And the difference between relative and absolute, you don't have to worry too much. You know, a mouse is a relative device and you could, where you know, every time you move it, it just spits out a delta. And a touchpad is an absolute device. And when you're hitting the top left of the touchpad or the bottom right, um, those are always the same. It's always 00, zero or 128, 128. Why that matters is a subtle detail on the input event system filtering out values, but I won't go into that too much. The event codes, XYZ is pretty simple. You have a light sensor. That's when things start to break down. Is you know, it's just a single axis sensor. So what is the event code that it should it should output? Um, you know, was, I think that it's on this device it shows up as like EV gas or something like gas pedal. Right? There's a, lot, there's a lot of game heritage here. I've seen magnetometers that return EV hat. Like, what what is that? And this, the the standard starts to break down. But for regular sensors, people they usually show up like this. What bugs a lot of people about input event um, system is that you have four of these structs to represent what is really three, probably 16-bit values. So there could be a little bit of overhead, especially some of these high-rate gyroscopes that are you know, one kilohertz of data. Yeah, it's a lot of extra baggage to be 
to be bringing along, which is why people are uh, like I.O. But it's useful. Okay. So here's some links you can click on, some more reading um, about input event. I'll let you guys check that out later. So lib sensor. Okay, time. So its primary job is at startup, it, it tells Android, hey, here's the sensors I have. And then, as we just did the command line, it needs to control the sensors and read the data. OK. So remember I, I said ugly callbacks? Y you open up um, sensors.h, and this is, this is the function pointer you need to uh, implement that does get sensor list. Ugly. But the best part is you find someone else's implementation, and you just tweak on that. So it makes <coughs> so it makes sensors available, and it has more methods like activate, you know, it's enable, disable, set delay, how fast you want the data, you know, be be wary of um, milliseconds and nanoseconds and, and all that. And this this sensor data, when you pull, see that struct sensors data, sensor data t, this one right here. So we got those input events that had um, values that were integer values. Inside that sensor data t, it wants floating point values. So that's you know, really the job of lib sensor is to convert those driver values into Android's you know, preferred engineering units. And here we go. That's what I was just talking about. And this, the sensor data t has a nice union, so you can get at it as, as like a vector or an XYZ, or we've got a few more things in there. Another thing besides doing units is also the orientation of sensors. This is, drives, drives uh, everybody crazy. I've spent more hours in my life than I care to admit because someone has laid out the sensor on the board, you know, one sensor this way and the rest of them all that way. And it really comes into effect, you know, the y plus y is supposed to be here and z out that way. And it's a real time waster to get, get them all oriented in the same direction. Um, and that's another big job of the sensor. All right. So there's the header link. Um, take a look. There's actually, it talks about, there's some decent comments in the header about Android's conventions for how it wants sensors. As I said, adapt an existing implementation. If you are cooking your own, I recommend um, one of these rowboat, ones from rowboat. A lot of the ones, if you look in the AOSP tree um, on Nexus devices, will have um, proprietary links to sensor manufacturer, sensor fusion. And it really gets in the way of what you want to do. And this is kind of a, a more simple place to start. I don't really uh, like this. I think this, so the sensor base is, is the class. This is in that canonical implementation of, um, of LibSensor. They utilize this class, and I think this represents a lot of what people don't like about C++. And it's kind of thrown together, but it works. And what it does, you, you derive your own uh, from sensor base, an accelerometer sensor, or a gyro sensor, or um, you, know, you can do a generic three-axis sensor, however you like, and you utilize this input event. Someone else has done the, the ugly bits of um, pulling the input event and, and getting that, so you can reuse that. You know, it takes care of issues you don't want, want to. All right, so go ahead and um, you know, follow these links. Here's one um, from the uh, Samsung Tuna. What is that? The Galaxy Nexus. I always get all those Nexus names confused. And you look in there, and you'll see that the light and the pressure sensor are just brought out in the same way that they are in the, the TI Rowboat lib sensor. But then for, ev for the um, inertial sensors, the, the magnetometer, accelerometer, gyro, 
it's all taken care of by the EmbedSense MPL layer. And that can be um, problematic if you are trying to re-implement the HAL. All right. Um, so back kind of in, in the, oh, my box is off there. Some, some more stuff to read about Linux infrastructure. Um, like I said, IIO is um, definitely, if you're, if you're looking into sensors, the latest InventSense drivers are all IIO. The latest ST drivers are all IIO. And um, there are lots of legacy, or you know, legacy has a bad connotation. There's lots of input event drivers out there, too. Um, and some more reading on, on the lower sensor device standards as well. All right. So things to remember. Um, you want to implement the glue in between and how. Reuse what you can. And uh, try and find drivers that you can use. Nobody likes debugging drivers. All right, so what's next? Um, the HAL hasn't changed in the last three um, Android releases. The implementation of sensor managers changed, though. So it used to be you could only have one accelerometer in a system. Now, if, you're, if you're, uh, your implementation of LibSensor says that there are two accelerometers, um, in ICS, both of those will show up. Sensor fusion demons, that's that, that binary bit um, I was talking about that uh, InventSense puts out. Sensor Platforms actually puts one of those out, too. Um, they make it a little harder for um, the hackers and all of us. But if you, if you do present just the raw sensors, Android will compute uh, some sensor fusion for you. It's, it's not great. I wouldn't steer spacecraft with it or little robots. Um, but it gets the job done. These dedicated sensor processors are an interesting idea. I sort of see it as the flip side of uh, graphics processing. There's a surprising amount of math and physics that goes into, um, into this stuff, and um, a lot of computation. And if you can, you know, anything you do to keep that application process from waking up, so people are either um, putting dedicated sensor hubs or combining the, the touch controller with the sensor hub uh, together, or the GPS and the sensor hub. And uh, it's an interesting architecture choice. Along with that, you know, in the future, I, I really see something more like an OpenGL for sensor processing happening, uh, especially as we start pushing the bounds of what these virtual sensors are and, uh, and what you can do with them. Like I said, those virtual sensors, uh, we think, are, are pretty interesting. <coughs> All right, so uh, that's all I have. Um, happy to take any questions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. The question is, uh, I, I talked a lot about, sens I, I mentioned sensor fusion. I didn't talk about it a whole lot. Where does it show up? Let's go back here. So. <clears throat> Sensor fusion, there's nothing to say it can't happen right here. It, it's, it's typically, um, if not straight in the HAL, there are some, uh, there's some fusion from uh, that, I should say, the InventSense MPL. They, straight from the HAL, they load up a shared object library. And that shared object library does the fusion. Um, the AKM is a magnetometer, a compass manufacturer. You go to AKM's website, you can download their AKM Demon, which used to be on uh, the Crespo device, the, um, I believe. And you know, you, you think about a Demon, you can run top, and you can see, wow, you know, I think that AKM D takes five or six percent of the CPU when you when you're doing a you know, full device orientation, which is that's the, the tough thing that sensors want to do. With these dedicated sensor processors, you know, the, the always on kind of thing, if nobody's listening to the sensors, calibration's always running in the background. And um, I was talking about dedicated sensor processors. They're starting to push that calibration and even some fusion down into the hardware. And it has some interesting battery trade-offs with the uh, requisite you know, increase in bill of materials costs. 
<laughs> yeah, so there is a, um, if you provide a, if you don't provide a rotation vector, so rotation vector orientation, the sensor service will actually use the MP light and do some fusion for you. Um, you know, another one of my, I'm going to get on my soapbox about um, virtual sensors is that, so you could also think of screen orientation as sensor fusion. It, it's taking the accelerometer and trying to figure out, are you holding it this way or are you holding this way? I don't know how many times, you know, I, a lot of times I just turn it off. If I'm laying on the couch and it's got it wrong, I want to see it this way. And I think that's part of the problem is that they're doing some sensor fusion, um, trying to make this virtual screen orientation sensor. They're doing it up here. Whereas if they would have made that a virtual sensor in the how, somebody else has a better idea. Maybe they want to use the camera and track my eyes and correlate that with gravity and say, hey, gravity, you know, the device is facing this way, but he's really looking like that. So let's not change the screen. Unfortunately, that's not something that you can do because there is a little bit of fusion happening up there. So uh, I guess if that's a, oh one other question. Yeah, IO um, industrial um, IO <laughs> I believe input output industrial input output. So you know sensors have this there's such a broad connotation, right? I mean you can think of a camera is is a light sensor. Why doesn't that show up here? All right. But it, you know strictly more sensors. You, um, I've seen people talk about, you, know, you come from the PC world on, on Linux, and there's like hardware mon for monitoring fan speed and, um, and CPU temperature. Those are sensors. But they're very, they're kind of low rate. The information that comes out, you know, it's, it's, is, um, isn't very fast. On the other end, you have people like at CERN who, you know, they have um, sensors in, in the, the super colliders that are putting like gigabyte, uh, gigabits of data a second. And so the you know, input event definitely won't work for them. Um, you can actually see in one of the big complaints about I.O. Um, that they say, well, that doesn't even work. And I.O. Um, comes from, the, um, from analog devices, right? Uh, sensors, another way to look at a sensor is really the silicon, it's this MEM stuff is you're doing very minute changes in electrical properties, and they have really good uh, analog to digital converters in there. And so uh, you know, they're kind of fancy analog to digital converters, or device specific. And the kind of data rates that uh, analog devices were seeing, and you know, they wanted to buffer a lot of data, the um, input event system wasn't working for that. You know, they want to do one, one kilohertz data rates. And so IO has support for um, uh, buffered data, multiple channels of data, being able, it, rather than, remember I talked about how a magnetometer coming back is you know, EV hat. What, what's, what's that about? You can actually name each of the data channels that are they're coming out. The, the downside to IO, though, in my opinion, is it's, it's, too, it's overly flexible. You know, whereas I can get an input um, event device and read X, Y, Z, and I've got 90% of what I want. Um, and so the I.O., you know, just because you, your lib sensor is targeting one I.O. driver doesn't mean you can, you can uh, instantly go to another one. It, it may look uh, quite different. Yeah? That is a, um, that's a good question. So the question is, if you have multiple accelerometers, um, which, one, which one takes precedence? And um, you know, actually, I, I haven't looked at the um, sensor manager API for that, um, but I've, I've brought up, I think Doug Mahal brought two of them up, and, and they show up. So um, good question. I, I'll follow up and look into that. OK. Well, if uh, that's all the questions, um, please feel to come on up if there's anything else you want to ask. Thank you. <laughs>